Uh, thank you so much, Jay, uh, for the great introduction. And uh, I, it was uh, a great honor for me to participate in this uh, session. And uh, I hope that uh, everyone posted this uh, presentation will get a good uh, sense about uh, the landscape of PDH cancer and also the uh, progress we made in, in terms of uh, developing uh, innovative software tools and uh, uh, sharing uh, data to advance PDH cancer research. So I will start uh, making sure that the slide look good. Okay, uh, so I'll start with my uh, discussion on genomic variants in PDH cancer landscape, pre uh, precision oncology, and data sharing ecosystem. So in the kind of the conventional world, what we consider genomic variants to, to precision medicine is a one way direction, which start with a, a research cohort and we profile, uh, perform molecular profiling, including next, next generation sequencing on these cohorts. And from the resulting data, we will identify um, pro prognostic markers or markers that predictive of drug sensitivity and resistance or markers that predict uh, of adverse uh, events. And this can be applied in future applications of um, clinical samples. However, as uh, clinical sequencing become a standard approach, we feel that this is actually a iterative process, that we can learn so much from the genomic data and the outcome from the patients. So the resulting data generated from the clinical profiling could also be feedback to research as a loop to uh, launch an, another iteration of research that keep improving on the process of our, um, our effort in uh, improving the care of the patients. So our journey uh, on PDH cancer genome analysis starts from the research prospect and with the launch of the PDH cancer genome project in 2010, where we analyzed uh, major high-risk subtypes of leukemia, solid tumor, and brain tumor. So for this effort, we have uh, analyzed uh, pair tumor whole genome sequencing data from 700 patients for exome sequencing of 1,500 patients and over 1,000 RNA-seq. Uh, more importantly, we also performed experimental validation for over 2 million uh, somatic alterations. And that ensures that we can develop innovative uh, analytic, uh, analytical tools that can support clinical um, investigation in the future. So the research outcomes of these studies have been published in 35 high impact journals, defining a variety of pH cancer driver genes uh, that can be used for developed clinical application. So once we complete the data analysis on the individual cancer types, we also collaborate with the National Cancer Institute on the target initiatives to perform pan cancer analysis so that we can uh, looking for the commonality and differences uh, between different subtypes of PDH cancer. So in this study, we have collaborated with leaders in ALL, AML, neuroblastoma, Wilms tumor, osteosarcoma. When we were launching our study, uh, we also uh, realized that uh, Germany has also started with their own uh, pan cancer analysis. So to ensure that we are coordinate this research effort, uh, but without uh, kind of uh, repeating, uh, having uh, redundancy, we actually supplied all the whole genome sequencing data from St. Jude led PCGP to the German group so that we can analyze an independent cohort and the uh, kind of cross-validate our findings uh, with um, independently. So for the NCI target project, uh, we have analyzed uh, close to 1,700 pH cancer patients that were analyzed by whole genome, uh, whole exome, or RNA-seq on these uh, six different subtypes. So the whole genome sequencing by uh, the target project uses a complete, complete genomics platform and this company actually uh, produces about 100 million candidate variants due to some of the PCR artifacts uh, involved in sequencing uh, protocol. 
So what we have done is we have developed a very elaborative uh, filtering um, and QC check uh, processes so that at the end, we were able to utilize about 44,000 uh, curated variants from these 100 million at the start and apply the statistical analysis tools uh, to identify 142 driver genes. We also applied uh, another approach we, that were initially developed for a clinical sequencing initiative called pathogenicity classification. That led to the discovery of 82 additional variants uh, that were, cannot be discovered by the statistical test. So what we learned from this data set is that um, the majority, 50%, 5% of the driver genes are absent in the three um, pan cancer studies of adult cancer. And this really have a profound impact on how we should consider PDH cancer uh, uh, treatment, that PDH cancer patients cannot be treated merely as a small sized adult. And the, the other lesson we learned is about 62% of the driver variants are caused by structural variations or co copy number alterations. This really indicating uh, that the whole genome sequencing profile is a critical and important uh, technology that had to be applied in both the research and the clinical testing of PDH cancer patients. So uh, when we're looking into the biological processes that altered in these uh, six subtypes of PDH cancer, uh, this is a map that shows how the processes on the y-axis and the cancer genomes are different subtypes on the x-axis. But we also mapped the proportion of the genes unique to PDH cancer in these colors. So what we've shown here is that transcription factor, which is a top regulated, uh, dysregulated uh, class of the genes in PDH cancer, the majority of these were absent uh, in adult cancer suggesting that therapeutical approaches targeting this group is required to ensure that we find uh, new approaches to target these driver variants that, that are specific to PDH cancer. We also performed the mutational signature analysis in PDH cancer in collaboration with Vladimir Alexandrov from UCSD. So initially, we did not expect to see anything that of a uh, major surprise, but uh, strikingly, we were finding a subset of the PDH leukemia that harbor UV light signature uh, in, these, um, in their genome. And as we can see here, uh, these uh, uh, mutations caused by UV light signature actually account for a high proportion of um, mutations in their cancer genome. And we look into the details of the breakdown of uh, the AL subtypes as well as ethnicity. We can see the majority of the all patients um, are Caucasians or Asian. There's no African American descent, and as well as they don't have uh, kind of a driver fusion genes normally discover, uh, discovered in defining the sub uh, subtype of uh, leukemia patients. So it indicates that perhaps uh, UV exposure may be related to, uh, may increase the risk of, uh, uh, of pediatric leukemia. So in this cohort, we just lack of sufficient uh, number of the patients to make statistical calculation of UV association with uh, the patient. So uh, future analysis is required to replicate the study uh, to establish the link of UV exposure to leukemia onset. And this study was a uh, multi-disciplinary uh, research uh, that with participation of um, two uh, a postdoc, former postdoc fellow, uh, Yu Liu, and uh, a senior scientist, uh, Xiao Tu Ma, in my lab. Uh, with uh, support from the NCI target team, as well as um, variety of uh, different laboratories in St. Jude, uh, including um, the genomics laboratory, um, uh, the software development group, Biostats, and also um, other collaborators uh, in the uh, external collaborators uh, like Latmil and uh, uh, Bob Huther, a formal trainee in my lab. 
and uh, the studies are supported by National Cancer Institute. So the next I want to talk about the collaboration we have with Shanghai Children's Medical Center uh, with a focus on looking into drug resistant mutations in relapse pediatric uh, AL sample. And this is the study uh, published, uh, was recently published uh, in blood uh, this year. And we have performed whole genome sequencing and uh, RNA sequencing of diagnosis relapsed germline trials of 103 patients uh, treated in China. And uh, these patients can be divided into, based on the time of the relapse, into three groups of uh, very early uh, relapses, which relapse occurred uh, in uh, before nine months, early relapses uh, between nine to 36 months, and this is where um, before the end treatment of leukemia or late relapse, which defines the, a subgroup of the patients that have um, that has a post treatment relapse. So uh, what we have discovered is that relapse specific mutations are enriched in 12 genes, which are highlighted here that, that have uh, that known to be involved in uh, pathways uh, of the drugs that, use, uh, that were used in treating uh, leukemia patients. And these drugs include growth of corticoids, thalpurine, and mesotrexate. And we look, when we look at the leukemia, um, where, uh, which patients uh, group that these leukemia uh, resistant mutation occur, we do see that very early relapse uh, patients, uh, meaning that during the treatment relapses, they have a much enriched uh, mutational burden in these 12 genes compared with very early relapse, suggesting that acquisition of these mutations may be uh, related to therapy. Again, we looked into the mutational signatures of the, that present in the diagnostic samples and the real samples of these patients. So in this graph, uh, the y-axis re uh, representing the number of the mutations, somatic mutations, and each of these uh, columns representing one a paired patient uh, in the diagnosis and relapse. So we can see that and the color coding re representing the mutations uh, attributed by different uh, mutational signature. So what we can see here is that uh, at relapse, the mutation, uh, mutation burden has increased substantially compared with the relapse. And also we found two novel signatures, what we call A and B, uh, that were shown in uh, blue and uh, magenta color here that are only present in relapsed patients. And we also see they're absent in the very early relapse, but were highly in, uh, enriched in the early and late relapse, again, suggesting a potential link to therapy. So these novel A and novel B signatures are not only providing uh, passenger mutations, as we could see, that some of the uh, relapse specific genes uh, that in the previous 12 gene uh, panel, PRSPS1, TP53, could be introduced by, uh, caused by novel signature A, and NT5C2, NR3C1, and TP53 could be caused by uh, novel signature B. So to find out which drugs might be related to the rise of these two mutational signatures, we, look, we looked into, uh, we performed this in silico experiment by uh, looking into mutational signatures of the pan cancer adult co cohort analyzed by the peacock, uh, peacock groups, as well as uh, mutational uh, signatures in the NCR target, uh, which include both diagnosis and the relapsed uh, diseases in neuroblastoma, AML, and AL. So what we found is that normal signature A appears to be uh, you know, predominantly discovered in the Shanghai cohort. We only found uh, one patient in ALL target that relapsed uh, in this, uh, that have this novel signature A, suggesting uh, an agent that probably uh, unique to the Shanghai treatment that led to the rise of this uh, cohort. By contrast, um, Novel signature B were found in both the AL target and uh, relapses and Shanghai cohort. 
uh, suggesting that the agents used in both the U.S. and Shanghai cohort may contributing to this uh, um, uh, this signature. So we speculated that purine treatment, which was used in the maintenance therapy post the uh, induction therapy in AL treatment, may be responsible given the timeline of uh, uh, acquisition of these mutations between the, uh, the uh, nine months to uh, 36 months in the patient cohort we, we received. So to prove that, what we have done is to perform an exper uh, kind of a um, an in vitro experiment. So the first experiment we did is to use the REH cell line, which is a known uh, leukemia cell line, and treat them with uh, thalpurines, as we've shown here. So each of the columns representing one cell line with specific treatment. And we isolated single cell clones and perform whole genome sequencing uh, on these uh, uh, post-treatment cell line. And the result is actually a little bit disappointing as we, uh, we found that most of the, uh, the new mutations we observe appear to be uh, in these cell, single cell um, colonies that we isolated appear to be shared among these uh, individual uh, single cell clones, suggesting that they are pre-existing uh, in the the parental uh, REH cell line. So the treatment is only selecting uh, for single cell that would already har harbor these mutations. So um, when we did a little bit further check, we recognized that AL cell lines, uh, most of them were uh, you know, acquired uh, from relapsed AL cells instead of the untreated uh, primary cells. So that's indicating it is not the right model to uh, looking into the uh, acquisition of novel signatures uh, that uh, due to the treatment. So uh, the normal breast cancer cell, uh, breast cells, uh, <laughs> breast cell line MCF10 was previously used for uh, uh, kind of uh, confirming the acquisition of cisplatin signature uh, in relapsed uh, breast, uh, breast primary tumors. So uh, in the second uh, experiment, what we did is using the MCF10 cell line and treated with thalpurine and, uh, and also comparing the treated cells with untreated cells, as well as uh, treated, we also performed the cell, uh, cisplatin treatment in the M MCF10 cell line. That way we could look into um, whether our experiment as a, uh, to use this uh, platinum treatment as a uh, positive control uh, to, to see we could replicate existing results. And this time we do see uh, very distinct private uh, mutations in contrast to the REH, suggesting the experiment is work. So first we were able to confirm our positive, uh, positive control experiment of this platinum did reproduce uh, the same signature as what was previously published as the cisplatin signature. And then when we look at the novel mutations gained from these two experiments, they indeed bear the same signature as we found in the novel signature B in the uh, patient sample confirming that treatment to thalpurine indeed caused the novel signature B that we observed in the patient sample. So this study really uh, tell us that uh, the, the cause for the uh, relapses uh, in AL will require expansion of existing models for relapse. So the current models uh, that, that account for the relapse are two, uh, which is one is called de novo resistance, meaning that the cells uh, you know, does not respond to response uh, to drug treatment at all. And this was not observed in our ALL study because our patient went through remission. So the debulking of the tumor already happened in, the two, uh, in our cohort. The second is chemo uh, selection. Uh, and this is kind of the, uh, the predominant model, which suggests uh, that uh, pervading model that suggests that uh, 
uh, selecting of selection of a small single clone and leading to the relapse of the cancer. And this model, we believe, is account for very early relapses in our cohort. So the new model we propose is that there's actually a two-phase uh, you know, approach uh, leading to relapse. First is a chemo selection of a persistent, persistent clone that can survive uh, chemotherapy as shown in these uh, light blue line here. But chemotherapy will induce additional mutations uh, that lead to the clonal expansion of a relapse. And these are likely, the model is likely to account for the early and late relapses. So this really uh, suggests that could be a model of, uh, for monitoring uh, the persistent clone before their acquisition of a uh, chemo-resistant mutation that may determine uh, that that some of the chemotherapy need to be ceased and switching to some other for those that, um, for patients that uh, survived uh, the initial uh, chemotherapy. So the most of the computational analysis was led by Sam Brady uh, in my uh, laboratory. And uh, there's a multiple institution uh, from Shanghai, Tianjin and Anhui in China uh, participated in this study and uh, uh, Ben Raphael's group from, from uh, Princeton University uh, helped with uh, computational modeling and analysis of um, clonal evolution in this study. Now I want to switch gears talking about uh, uh, kind of my uh, changes uh, from um, research to clinical genomics. So this is the effort that requires uh, collaboration from multiple uh, departments, including pathology, uh, our department, oncology, cancer predisposition, and uh, sub uh, subject experts. So the, the approach we use is uh, what we call the three platform involving whole genome, whole, uh, whole exome RNA-seq. So we actually started the work in um, uh, 2013 to develop a computational pipeline that enable integration of the data from all these uh, three platforms. In 2015, we launched the Genome for Kids protocol. Uh, this is when we start to analyze uh, real patient data to look into the feasibility of applying these approaches to, uh, to patients. 2017, we uh, expanded the uh, process to including uh, a rapid turnaround RNA-seq pipeline. This is to support the total 17 uh, treatment protocol for evaluating target therapy for high-risk leukemia patients. And we also in, uh, incorporated the FFPE pipeline that in only include uh, whole exome and RNA-seq in 2017. And uh, in, uh, 20, uh, uh, in 2017, also we started to, to analyze the real-time uh, clinical um, uh, sequencing for every patient. And, uh, and currently, we have already analyzed over 2,000 cases using the combination of the three platform rapid RNA-seq and FFP protocol. So the computational pipeline uh, for three platform sequencing uh, development was led by Michael Rush in my group. And so what we have done is uh, to start with uh, three platform sequencing, generating data, perform QC check, and then we have uh, extensive analysis uh, for both the somatic um, and uh, sequence variants, uh, including single nucleotide and uh, copy number structural variation, as well as for germline-based uh, analysis. And then we perform variant classification uh, using uh, 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 an algorithm we created called Meadow Ceremony that include a harmonization of data resources uh, coming from a variety of the databases that we have uh, curated. And that way that we can perform a assign gold, silver, and bronze medal to every variant we discovered. And then uh, finally, the a panel will convene to convert our medals into uh, five class uh, categories of pathogenic, likely pathogenic variant of um, unknown significance, likely benign and benign, to sign out uh, the tumor and germline report. 
for every patient has gone through this pipeline. So I want to mention that, uh, you know, this uh, with the applications of this approach to uh, clinical sequencing, we actually can uh, make therapeutic changes for a subset of the patients that are not enrolled in um, clinical trial. And this is one example that therapy changes occurred based on the use of uh, the ClinGen data. And this is a patient enrolled in Genome for Kids and uh, he, he, is a, he had the metastatic melanoma and who had failed multiple therapies, including the immunoth immunotherapy. Um, so the, pay, uh, the tumor was analyzed by the three platform sequencing and we discovered a MAPS-VK8 uh, gene fusion for this patient. And uh, um, the, the fusion involved uh, loss of the, uh, the last exon of MAPS-VK8 and based on literature search that we found that this could cause auto uh, activation uh, because the last exon uh, encodes the auto inhibitor domain on max 3 k 8 So we project that this will lead to activation of MAP kinase signaling independent of BRAF. And the patient lacks BRAF B600E mutation usually found in melanoma. So we proposed for using a MAC inhibitor, trametinib, and the patient got total response, but unfortunately developed the resistance. So this is the case of N1 we discovered in our cohort. And the next question is that, do we found more patients uh, with this uh, fusion event? So in collaboration with Amita uh, Baharami at Pathology, who had an archive of um, FAP materials with spitzoid melanoma, we performed RNA-seq and discovered that MAP3 uh, gene fusion or truncation actually has the highest mutational preference um, in this cohort. And these changes are mutually just, uh, exclusive with all the other uh, kinase activation events discovered in this cohort. More strikingly, all these events involving the loss of the exon line, uh, as we can uh, pinpoint the locations of these uh, gene fusion or trans, trans, uh, truncation events discovered in this cohort. So the pattern on the RNA sequencing data is also very clear in that we see a diminished exon line um, expression uh, compared with exon 8. So then we were curious to see whether this event can also be found in adult melanoma. So the strategy uh, we use uh, is that we were able to uh, design a very quick analysis, uh, just looking at exon eight expression to exon nine expression differences on 472 melanoma samples and was able to find eight of them actually show a diminished uh, exon 9 expression. So we just need to download these eight samples and perform the RNA-seq um, gene fusion detection using the uh, software Cicero that we um, recently published. And all eight of them show a uh, gene fusion event similar to what we found in PDH cancer. So currently we are collaborating with chemical biology department for testing new compounds that specifically targeting MAP3K8. And this study was published last year in uh, Nature Medicine uh, in collaboration with uh, Amita Bahramani. Now I want to uh, discuss uh, the lastly about uh, some effort I really feel very passionate about, which is data sharing and visualization on St. Jude Cloud. So the study that we uh, you know, the subject that we included in, uh, involves both the PDH cancer patients as well as uh, cancer survivors uh, as uh, ensuring quality of the life of can PDH cancer patient survivor is also a main objective of how to develop le less toxic um, treatment uh, so that uh, we can ensure there's a long time high quality life of the survivors. Uh, we also have 800 um, pediatric um, sickle cell disease patients uploaded in uh, the St. Jude Cloud. And this work was led by Clay McLeod in Xinzhou uh, in our department. 
So why doing the cloud platform? What we believe is that the traditional approach that we have, uh, which involves uh, a data repository that will require every users to download their own copy of the data and set up our own uh, local infrastructure to perform the data analysis. While doing a cloud-based platform, we only need to uh, upload the data and the tools once and everyone can use the shared computing uh, infrastructure on the cloud to perform this analysis. So we think in the long term, it will be the most efficient use of the data and tools that we developed. So St. Jude Cloud actually, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, including data from both retrospective uh, research study as well as from pro pro prospective clinical sequencing initiative from St. Jude. Uh, this is a project I introduced briefly um, before. So we, the data set we include uh, involving pH cancer patients, uh, about 3,000 of them now, cancer survivorship, about uh, 7,000, and the non-cancerous uh, sickle cell disease, uh, 800. So we perform data harmonization, curation, metadata collection, and also the data has, will be kind of shared around uh, three different platforms. One is a genomics platform. Uh, this is a platform that allows users to be able to access raw data, run analysis. And I want to mention this platform was developed in collaboration with DNA Nexus, which uh, can ensure safe uh, cloud-based uh, genomic data storage and also Microsoft Azure. And I want to really uh, mention that Microsoft actually played a very important role in our endeavor, ensuring that we get um, free storage and computing on the Azure platform uh, when developing this uh, infrastructure. And the, another part is we call the PDH Cancer uh, Knowledge Base, where we have called PCON, where we have uh, obtained published data and curated data uh, from PCGP and other uh, studies so that uh, the research community can freely access these information without going to correlating data from different resources. And uh, data visualization tools, uh, it's called visualization community that enable users to interactively, interactively explore these data. So the uh, PCON and, and the visualization community uh, can be accessed without uh, applying for data access. While the genomic platform, uh, we uh, require data access um, agreement as we want to ensure the patient data are protected with security. So currently, uh, St. Jude Cloud uh, have uh, about 1.2 petabytes of raw data from uh, over 10,000 patients. Uh, over uh, 200 data access has been granted uh, for raw data, and we have uh, 2,000, close to 2,000 registered users that they can pr uh, perform on the fly uh, analysis using the cloud infrastructure. And per week, we have 2,500 unique users. And uh, our last month, we actually exceeded uh, the 10,000 user marker on the monthly basis. So this is kind of the breakdown of uh, the retrospective uh, studies and the pros pro prospective clinical sequencing data that currently hosted on St. Jude. And I just uh, provided the, uh, the, gene, uh, the pair tumor no normal genome and survivor ge whole genome uh, tumor subtypes here. So we can see that uh, we are able to uh, represent major subtypes of PDH cancer data set on St. Jude Cloud. So I want to mention a little bit more on our real-time clinical genomics screen, uh, streaming. And this is uh, uh, an effort that we have uh, uh, put together to ensure that research community can access data on as soon as possible without waiting for us to publish the first uh, papers uh, utilizing these data sets. So we call these RTCG. And the RTCG uh, pipeline actually uh, was developed so that the ClinGen data um, can be uploaded uh, in, on, onto St. Jude Cloud. 
So it involved a couple of uh, very critical steps, including verifying the patient consent. And this verification uh, actually was done on a regular basis because we also need to verify there's no re uh, retraction of the consent. And the retraction happens, we'll pull out the data set um, of the St. Jude Cloud to ensure it's in compliance with the current status of the consent. Uh, the other one is extensive QC check that uh, went in and also the metadata collection. And we also performed the data harmonization to ensure that the PenGen data are in sync with what data has already been uploaded on St. Jude Cloud. So I want to mention that this is also a almost like a semi-automated process that uh, it was launched in May 2019. And these are the data points uh, reflecting the data growth from March uh, to July this year. So this is the pandemic hits. And we were able to see that even with the, <laughs> with the COVID um, affecting many other things that we are doing, that at least the, our data sharing effort has not been hampered by the virus. So uh, rare cancer types is always difficult to assemble as the real-time clinical sequencing uh, analyzes every eligible patients uh, in St. Jude. We're able to see that the, you know, some of the very rare uh, cancer subtypes are represented in our data offering on St. Jude Cloud. So uh, availability of these data sets will really uh, help with gaining knowledge about how to treat these uh, rare cancer subtypes in the future. So we don't want to data just sit idle on the cloud. The, the whole purpose is to ensure that researchers can also use some of the innovative tools that we have uploaded on St. Jude Cloud to do the analysis. And our approach is to ensure that these tools was designed in a way that by point, uh, by point and click, the people can uh, utilize our tools and have nice visualization to look at the result. So currently the tools we have put on the cloud, including some of the tools that were wrapped around with the very popular algorithms that are used by everyone, as well as some of the new tools that, that we published, uh, the researchers, uh, faculty members in computational biology in my department has published. Um, so I want to highlight one particular tool called SysX. This is a tool that was uh, developed in my laboratory uh, by one of the former postdoc fellow, Yu Liu, uh, with the goal is to discover a uh, regulatory non-coding variant in individual cancer genomes uh, by using this tool. So it was published in, uh, only uh, two months ago. Um, so the design of the software is that you can actually um, input samples with uh, pair tumor normal whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing data. So we're utilizing uh, a pattern called um, allele specific expression and outlier high expression so that we can look into uh, cis activated variants uh, in um, that as a signal for non-coding uh, driver variant. So the approach that we do is that you don't need to assemble a huge cohort for doing these type of the non-regulatory variants. And you can utilize individual cancer genome to uh, find out these driver, uh, driver uh, variant to do the analysis. And we also look into you know, incorporating some of the additional features like uh, transcription factor binding sites, and looking for uh, utilizing the gene expression matrix we have assembled through St. Jude Cloud, um, and, uh, and also looking at the TAD domains, others to find uh, the potential candidate of these. So we performed a benchmark analysis using uh, uh, you know, T-lineage AL samples uh, because um, TAL has many of the known um, kind of non-coding variants, and they actually were researchers uh, published through uh, at least, uh, you know, last five years, uh, many of the studies publish these non-coding variants uh, in this uh, disease. And by using SysX, we were able to discover nearly all of these events and also find um, some of the new events like uh, LM3 activation, 3 enhancer hijacking. 
and uh, the tau one activation through uh, through an intronic variant that hasn't been not being uh, reported before. Um, we also discover a new uh, potential oncogene called PRLR, and uh, this uh, variant I will show a little bit uh, detail is uh, discovered through the process of looking at the variant from whole genomes that are heterozygous, as you can see the two colors representing uh, red and the blue here. But in RNA-seq, only one color was shown, indicating only one chromosome was activated. And we are able to see there is um, a deletion event leading to the uh, removal of CTSCF boundary elements uh, from the uh, the from the existing data, suggesting that uh, uh, you know enhancer elements uh, involved in IL7R was uh, interacting with uh, the PRLR. This is a gene uh, involved in Jack uh, Jack signaling pathway, um, and the deletion will uh, enable interaction of uh, enhancers over here by that. And we were also able to show that even though the the event was only uh, discovered in one case in our Shanghai cohort that we were able to replicate the findings in two uh, COG samples uh, that were analyzed by um, NCI target. So now, uh, you know, the SysX uh, program is available to anyone uh, who wants to utilize uh, this, uh, you know, the analysis pipeline uh, to perform, uh, to analyze their own data. So um, I want to mention is that the switch gear about the PDH cancer knowledge base. And uh, this is uh, something that what we want to uh, collect, collect is to uh, compile the curated variants from both the St. Jude data as well as the, the NCI target cohort, um, as well as other major uh, institutions who are involved in uh, research in PDH cancer. So we have a close collaboration with the Germany uh, and we are able to incorporate uh, the samples they analyzed for their study uh, into the PECON as well. So I want to uh, mention that, you know, for example, the TP53 uh, gene locus that we are able to incorporate data from, uh, uh, you know, three published studies and also uh, have a an approach of showing uh, both the sequence mutation as well as uh, expression changes in, uh, in parallel for these type of investigation. So the uh, sequence mutations in, we incorporate include those that identified at the diagnosis as well as those found at the relapse. And I want to point it out that in this um, P53, there's R248Q mutation that we can see it is not only a hot spot at uh, the diagnostic samples, but also uh, were present in the relapse at the hot spot, uh, which is not found in any of the other hot spot mutation, suggesting there's some unique uh, mutagenesis mechanism leading to our uh, this hot spot mutation, and we are currently investigating uh, this uh, in collaboration uh, with our Shanghai colleagues uh, doing the cell line model. So <clears throat> the visualization community, uh, a new addition of this is the, uh, the testing plot that we performed uh, in looking into organizing the data sets, uh, RNA-seq data set we have that enable classification of pa uh, patient samples uh, by expression profile analysis. So one of the new interface we added is that not only we analyze our own data, but also allow uh, researchers to import their own RNA-seq data and see where their, their sequencing, uh, their data sample can be clustered with the, um, the reference cohort we assembled here. And we are already using that for our own internal clinical sequencing uh, effort to help with uh, classifying some of the hard to diagnose samples that we encounter. So um, the visualization community uh, is not as, uh, you know, not only taking uh, data from uh, the novel, but we also trying to incorporate the graphs that has been published uh, in variety of pH cancer researchers into interactive uh, visualization modules that people can explore. So this is a screenshot of the uh, pan neuroblastoma studies that we published recently uh, on nature communication that involving 
analyzing uh, your your blastoma samples on, uh, into uh, that were using data generated from three different institutes. So uh, the, this graph actually uh, is uh, visualization is actually interactive and. Uh, that can be explored in our uh, visualization community as a dynamic uh, graph. So if people here are uh, interested in your Rastoma, I highly recommend you to uh, check it out uh, on St. Jude Cloud. So the future and the ongoing work that we have, uh, one is we also have uh, recently developed a new tool called Genome Paint for, visualize, uh, for visualizing non-coding variants. Um, and uh, so that uh, some of the epigenetic profiling data, including HI-C, uh, ATAC-C, CAPTCH-C can be utilized to uh, identify uh, driver vi variant. Uh, the example here showing is a duplication event of uh, intensive region uh, that we found in v lineage al that interacted with a uh, CMIC promoter. So this study was uh, uh, has been accepted in cancer cell, and the, uh, you know the visualization tool is already uh, accessible to anyone uh, interested in, it, and you can find that in uh, on Saint Jude Cloud. We also show that we actually uh, using this uh, tool, we discover something that may unveil some of the novel mechanisms uh, that affect the gene regulation uh, in PDH cancer. So over here working with uh, Mark Valentine at St. Jude. He designed the RNA, uh, performed a sequential RNA uh, DNA fish experiment, showing that the RNA enhanced expression is only occur in the amplified allele. More importantly, these, um, the duplication actually lead to the formation of RNA cloud, suggesting that enhanced RNA may change the chromatin structure um, that affects the 3D genome architecture of uh, on St. Jude uh, on the uh, uh, CMIC regulation. So we are uh, we also actually uh, working with NCI right now to port protein paint to NCI genome data commons. And they found our tools not can be only used for PDH cancer, but, but could also uh, help with uh, advancing the visualization of adult cancer. So we are also looking into support for non-cancer genome analysis utilizing some of our variant pathogenicity calls. So for example, working with Machin Gorodowski on looking at the MDS germline variant analysis. And we are very interested in evaluating the possibility of hosting data uh, by external curators. So uh, this is the end of my talk and uh, thank you very much and I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, questions are starting to come in and we're gonna jump right in. Um, first question came from Lauren Mills and her question is, um, what level of intermediate data are available? Can we get access to mature SNP, CNV, fusion and expression data? Yeah, so uh, the intermediate data included all the uh, curated somatic mutations uh, that we use for, uh, you know, curated meaning that those that in involving studies that were published. So for those data, uh, somatic, uh, this is genome-wide uh, SMV indel and uh, structural variation data that we have recently uploaded on the cloud. We have also offered uh, RNA-seq feature counts to users who uh, wants to use them. Uh, you don't need to apply for data access for these. So for, um, in terms of a gene fusion uh, event, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we made an effort trying to what we called annotate uh, subtype um, biomarkers, meaning that gene fusions are sequence mutations that define a specific PDH cancer subtypes. So for example, if people wants to use, uh, analyze rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma fusion positive versus negative, um, samples, they don't need to re-download and re-analyze everything, but we, they will be able to, just using the annotation we provide and on the sample uh, meta files to um, categorize this information. So we'd be very interested in 
people to actually utilizing the data give us more feedback on what are the additional uh, data elements that we can provide to serve the research community. So the next question comes in um, from Yang Ding and he said, uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, really wonderful to get an overview of the exciting tools and work you guys have done and inspiring for young investigators. And then in your variant calling pipeline, what tool do you use to call somatic structural variants? Yeah, so the somatic structural variation that we use uh, is using the uh, CREST algorithm that we have developed. Um, I, in my lab, developed very early on 2010. So we use that in conjunction with another tool called Concerting that uh, is a copy number variation tool. So because uh, what we found is that if you use the, uh, so for some of subclonal structural variations, uh, you will end up not having the power for detecting the subclonal structural variation if we just apply CREST alone. We do recognize there's, uh, you know, CREST was developed almost uh, 10 years ago. The new modern tools are available. So what we have recently did a fair amount of the benchmark analysis and we found that um, Manta appear to be uh, a good software that can is complementary to CREST in terms of can uh, discover additional variants that were missed by CREST. But there's also a subset of the variant Manta cannot discover, but CREST can discover. So we do plan to run Manta uh, on all the cohorts we host on St. Jude and provide the results to, um, to the community. So for gene fusion event, uh, we uh, we use them. I'll uh, use the Cicero algorithm that uh, recently published in Genome Biology, developed by my own lab uh, for this endeavor. And we also looking into some of the other softwares like SVABA to perform a potentially kind of uh, making sure that there's no missing event in the data set we have. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Barbara Rivera, and uh, she said, amazing work, thank you so much. Would it be possible to submit their data for analysis? How, how would we need to work around ethics on that sense when submitting data that requires controlled access? Uh, submitting data require what? Um, she wants to know if it's possible for them to submit their data for analysis on your platform. Yeah, if it's just uh, submitting uh, for analysis alone, uh, you don't need to have any, you know, you just upload your data on DNA Nexus. They provide the security and you can just use our tools uh, to perform the analysis. But if you want to use us to host your data on Synergy Cloud, that we would like to make sure there is agreement uh, that we can have permission to like data hosting agreement from you. And the data access actually will be approved by the researcher, not us. So the service we will provide is to ensure there's a data harmonization that happens so that the data that is supported by, um, provided by the user could be harmonized with the existing uh, infrastructures that we, you know, existing data sets that we have. So we're very open to uh, both supporting the data analysis and also um, you know, data analysis as well as uh, uh, data uh, sharing, uh, utilizing our uh, infrastructure. And also, you know, I want to mention uh, last two weeks ago, I was at UCSD and I was really thrilled to hear that researchers there have performed the episode analysis using one of their very innovative algorithms. They just uh, uploaded their tool to the DNA Nexus platform and was able to get the, just analyze the, um, a subset of the brain tumor samples that they are interested in directly utilizing um, the data we provided on the cloud. So this is kind of really what we are, I'm really eager to hope and hope that uh, especially computer scientists who are craving for data, this is a large resource that you have, you can get access to no uh, obligation for collaboration at all uh, that we would like, really, really like to share this data to advance the PDH cancer research as a whole. Thank you. And um, she responded and said, uh, thank you. She understands now. Um, 
you have time for a couple more? Yeah. Okay. Next question is from uh, Payal Jain. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk and your team's work. Uh, my question is, if you observe discrepancies in mutation calls between WGS and WXS for the same patient tumor, um, is that likely due to different read depths, caller metrics, et cetera? And then how is that handled and which data modality is prioritized, both on research and the clinical end? Yeah, uh, so I will kind of, uh, you know, talk about the clinical part because clinical is where we did the whole genome and the whole exome sequencing. So this uh, subject actually has been described in detail in our Nature Communication paper, the Rush Day All paper, that we have shown examples of how we resolve these. So what we have done is that, you know, uh, for the clinical, because everything is uh, treated with, uh, you know, we have to report variant to sign out reports. So any discrepancy was evaluated manually by a scientist. So what we have learned is that, uh, yes, there is, you know, for, for variant that was discovered only by whole genome sequencing alone, um, this may be usually related to the capture efficiency of exome. So when you have a, for example, an indel uh, coupled with, uh, you know, the polymorphisms in the exome that were used for capture, you actually have less efficiency of uh, capturing the indels in exome sequencing. That will lead to a missed call in um, exome compared with whole genome. So many times we can actually use RNA-seq data to cross-validate one of these uh, the platforms. But if the variant is not expressed, then you're out of luck. And then, um, because we have developed a lot of visualization tools, so it's eventually the curator is going to make the final call on that. So for, for sequence variant that were missed by whole genome but found in exome, these are mostly uh, related to the uh, subclonal variant that the whole genome data, which we are now using uh, 45x uh, X coverage, may lack the power for discovering them. Thank you. Um, so last question is going to come from me. Um, at first, I want to thank you for that neuroblastoma slide. I appreciate that. You know that uh, we care a lot about neuroblastoma. I was really interested in the three-platform three sequencing initiative that you're doing. And it seems like you, you guys are investing a lot of money into that. And do you know um, what the cost you're investing per patient to get all that done? Yeah, so I think the cost has a lot to do with the, uh, you know, with the platform. So when we started, it is very expensive because we, at the time, we don't have high seek. Uh, so that cost about $8,000 um, sequencing cost per, uh, per patient. With the um, NovaSeq, which we're using in clinical right now, it is uh, $3,000 a patient. I think, you know, the you know, the people always talk about sequencing costs, uh, you know, how much does it worth the effort. I thought you have to look beyond the value of this for just signing out the clinical report. Because mm -hmm. as you could see that the, we, as we share the research data within St. Jude and also with the broad community, uh, the value of this is go beyond just the signing out the patient samples period, but also to enable research to be carried out on these samples. So we already published eight papers that utilize these clinical sequencing data for, for a variety of the investigations. And also, I just for looking at the data access request uh, for our, um, that we received, that uh, more than 55% 50, uh, 50 of the, the data requests are actually targeting the, the clinical sequencing samples. And these are the most beautiful and highest quality data we ever generated because these machines were dedicated to clinical sequencing. There's no contamination. So even for something, just something like uh, uh, interesting, right? For example, we also were looking at the virus, you know, is there any uh, you know, viral genome uh, integration in pediatric cancer patients, right? Virus analysis. When we look at the data, uh, uh, generated from research cohort. Uh, so these were from the Washington University, the, the whole genome sequencing were done in Washington University, Hudson Alpha, the reference laboratories. 
we actually pick up viruses that not supposed to be belong to the uh, human genome, like viruses uh, in um, plants and stuff. Uh, so it indicating there's some tiny, you know, because the same sequencing machine were used, then you kind of picking up the residual, these uh, effects of um, machines being used for other samples. But for the ClinGen, as these machines were dedicated for the use of patient samples, no other <laughs> viruses <laughs> except the human being detected that. So I believe the uh, ClinGen sample is the most beautiful and the highest quality cancer genomic data ever existed. Uh, any um, computational scientists want to use for developing new tools, that's the best data set you can get. Yeah, so 3,000, I mean, it's a, it's a one-time cost. Once you do it, you have it. Yeah, once you, know? you do, you have it. You can mine it for other reasons. You can do things you never thought about possible for doing. So, for example, germline variation interpretation, right? So sometimes it's hard to tell uh, because, for example, we think if it's a variant is involved in some DNA mismatch repair, um, is this real or not real? If you want to have one copy, does it, does it matter? So with the whole genome sequencing data, we're able to utilize in the data, you know, like perform mutational signature analysis because PDH cancer has a very low mutational burden. You cannot run exon for mutational signature analysis, but whole genome, you have enough power. And then we detect DNA mismatch repair signatures that actually can have an implication for therapy in the future. Wow. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering that. And thank you so much for your time and your, your, um, your great talk. We really appreciate it. We appreciate everything that you're doing and um, hope that you stay well and, and be safe out there. Thank you, Jay. Uh, very nice to participate. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.